Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? The microphone is good? Yeah? Okay, so after that introduction, I'm gonna do the only thing that I can do now is disappoint you. Uh, <laughs> because, well, that was, uh, you know, quite something. So, usually I make technical talks, and this time it's gonna be a bit different. I'm gonna talk about culture in the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem. So first, let's talk about culture. Like, what is it? It's, what well, I'm just reading, the social behavior and norms found in human society. So, we as the Bitcoin Cash community, we are a human societies, or, you know, at least it looks like it, you're all humans, as far as I know. And uh, we have social behaviors and norms, and those social behaviors and norms have a huge impact on the project. And the reason why I want to focus on that point very specifically it's because we have better fundamental and we have better product and we are more useful than most other crypto out there. And I think that's a true statement. And I think this is like a testimony of the success of BCH. But also, we're only just 3% of BDC's value. So clearly there is something that we're not doing right. And clearly it's not fundamental, it's not product, it's not usefulness. It's something else. And I think... Um, this can be found in some element of our culture. So I have this quote here uh, from Navan Ravikant. I don't know if you guys know him, but he's like fairly well-known, um, fairly well-known like speaker and thinker and investor. And he said like, never trust anyone who do not annoy you from time to time, because it means that they are only telling you what you want to hear. And so today I'm gonna annoy you, you know, a bit in addition to disappointing you. So yeah, it's gonna be very bad. Um, but I feel like, um, you know, we kind of need to do it. So, there are two points, mainly, I think our culture is not doing the right thing, and those are going to be infrastructure and game theory. And so I'm going to talk a bit about infrastructure and game theory. Right, so, I think there are a few misconceptions on people that are not used to work in software infrastructure in general, but Basically, it works like any other kind of infrastructure. So basically, all kind of infrastructure decay. And we are under this impression that technology always gets better and better and better and never decays. But it turns out that actually it decays all the time. And we have just a, a bunch of engineers working in many, many companies that keep working at making it better and at fighting that decay. And I'm going to take a few examples. Right now, if you want to buy a cathode ray tube you know, television or monitor for your computer, I'm not sure why you want to do that, because we have better stuff now. But if you want to buy that, it's actually very difficult now. There are very little manufacturers that even know how to build them. We almost forgot, as a you know, human society, how to build those stuff. Because, well, there was not as high of a demand for them than there was before. And therefore, nobody really worked on maintaining the knowledge and the know-how and, and the factories and all of that that are required to build those stuff. And therefore, we don't build them. And this is the same for vinyl discs, right? You can buy vinyl discs today if you want. It's actually more expensive than it used to be 20 years ago. Um, we used to have space shuttle. Both Russia and the US used to have space shuttle. And then only the US used to have space shuttle, and now nobody has space shuttle anymore. Um, and and there, is, there is, I think, a never better counter example to that. It's that the US right now is refining uranium for nuclear weapon. Like on a regular basis, there are people working on that problem. Except that the US doesn't need any new uranium to make nuclear weapon because they are decommissioning the weapon that are too old and can reuse that uranium to build the new weapon that they are building. The demand for that is actually zero. Right? And still there are people making it and they just, you know, are basically making it and then storing it forever and it's never used. So why is the US spending money on that? Well, you would say government is usually pretty good at spending money on stuff that are not very useful, but in that case, there is a good reason. And the good reason is they don't want to forget how it's done. Because maybe one day it's going to be useful. And acquiring the whole knowledge of working with uranium and making enriched uranium, you know, refining uranium, is not, it's not obvious. It's a very complicated process. It involves like very advanced engineering and physics and all of that. And keeping people working on that problem ensure that the knowledge is kept through time. If you don't do that, those people are going to retire and then nobody will know to do it. Right? So in addition to decaying infrastructure time to fail from time to time, we can have zero days in, in software. We can have zero day, meaning 
uh, problem in the software that are not known and suddenly exploited live on the network. Uh, we can have denial of service attack, we can have like various failure of the hardware we run out on the network or you know whatever else. So just like any other infrastructure, we need people that essentially like, take care of the problem, fight the decay constantly doing maintenance, and also be ready to intervene whenever there is some issue. And that means that even if there is no new work to be done, you want to have a large enough group of people that are working on that every day, just making it like you know all nice and shiny and making sure the corner are round and everything. So that when something bad happens, you have people at hand that are available and that understand how the system works. So even if for nothing else you want you know a set large enough of people working on infrastructure for that to be possible. So we're not quite there yet, and we're very reliant on BTC, right? Because the software that we're using to run the network is actually a fork of the BTC code base. And this is not specific to Bitcoin Cash, this is the same for Litecoin and Dash and Zcash and whatever. There are many, many, many crypto that are just fork of the Bitcoin decode base. And all those crypto, they actually are reliant on BTC to do some maintenance work because they have smaller, you know, smaller team working on the infrastructure. And as a result, any rational market cannot price those other currency higher than BTC. It would just not make sense anymore. If BTC were to disappear, or were to fail on the market, and this problem is not addressed, then all those other currency are going to fail with it. Right? And, you know, that may not be what we want, but that's, you know, kind of like where we are right now. Um, so if we want, to you know, go to the next level, maybe become number one in that market, we need to fix that problem because it's not going to happen without it. So I was mentioning the 3% number before, and it's always very difficult to know uh, what are all the parameters that goes into those numbers. But one of them is that, like, just that alone, I'm sure that we are going to have a lower value than BTC always, as long as we don't fix that problem. OK. And Let's go, how do we fix that problem? Like what, what are the elements here that we have that you know, prevent us from fixing that problem? Well, first we need people with very specific skill sets. And the people that have experience in those skill sets, there are not that many of them, right? Because there are not that many places where you can work on system involving you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of users that do like millions of transactions per second, that have system that have you know, in the hundreds of gigabytes per second of throughput, this kind of stuff, right? There. There are just not that many companies in the world that operate at that scale. And as a result, um, the number of people that have the experience of working at that scale is also you know, pretty much limited to the people coming out of those companies. So we need to make sure that we are able to attract those people. Right? And we have another problem that I've been talked about with Justin Bones a bit yesterday, is that we don't want to leave all that to be fixed by third party. So it may seem nice, you know, like you have someone that is like, okay, you know, I have a big company, I'm making good money, I'm gonna pay, you know, people working on the infrastructure for everybody. I'm gonna hire some, you know, old time cyberpunk that uh, became famous because he made a t shirt about RSA, and I'm gonna use that, um, you know, uh, <laughs> to promote my company, hire a bunch of developers, and take the infrastructure, take care of the infrastructure for everybody. It's all good, people, like, don't worry, we are very competent. And indeed they are very competent, but they don't have your best interest in mind. They have their best interest in mind. And so, should they, right? It's not, it's, not evil, it's not evil to have your own interest in mind, but you got to remember, if you delegate that to others, they have their own interest in mind, they don't have yours. And so it's very important that you have different actors that have different interests that get involved into that game of maintaining the infrastructure, so they can keep each other in check. And if you don't quite understand the value for proposition for you as a business who builds on top of BCH, the best way to explain that to whoever is doing the financial of your company is as an insurance policy. You probably have an insurance on the building where your company is or on the or servers uh, so that if everything burns down, you can you know, get the money to get your business started and don't go in there. Well, this is the same thing. Your business is running on some infrastructure, and if it's this infrastructure, end up like going down, disappearing, or being taken in a direction that don't fit your business at all, your business is toast. And so you want to have an insurance policy there that ensure that the pieces that you rely on are going to be there for you when you need them. 
Okay, let's take an example. In that example, I purposefully did not put any name because I don't want to blame people. I want to use that as an example of a mistake that were made. Uh, I want you to understand that you know many also people have done many similar mistakes in that space. So um, if if all you take from what I'm saying here is like those people are bad and we should blame them, this is like completely the wrong stuff. But I think it's also useful to actually have a real life, you know real life size example. So on September 1st, at the beginning of the you know at the beginning of the week, we had a, a wave of spam that was broadcasted on the network. Right? Someone made like a bunch of transactions. And those were very visibly transactions that were not there to you know, actually do transactions. They were there to just create a bunch of load on the network and try to disturb um, you know, its, good, you know, its good behavior. And it turned out that most miners were producing blocks from 2 to 8 megabytes. And typical market demand is you know, below alpha megabytes, typically. And everything else above that was just spam, essentially. And if you ask any people that have experience in capacity planning, they are going to tell you that those limits are appropriate. Um, the reason why and, and you know, the alternative to raising those limits that you can use to mitigate the side effect are a bit complicated and they would you know, require a talk in itself to, to go into. Um, so I'm going to just use an argument from authority here, but you know, like, trust me, I, I know what I'm talking about here. Um, this is just like raising those limits is just not the solution. But some pool decided to increase the soft cap to 32 meg. And this has two main consequences that I wanted to you know, dig in to explain what is not the right solution. And the first one is that we have businesses that are building on BCH today. And those businesses, they are the one providing the value. They are the one making our network valuable, right? And so we need to treat those people as uh, first-class citizen. We need to treat those people as, you know, attract and value them as much as we can, right? And those people, they find themselves in a position where they either can dedicate their resources and their attention and, you know, their time to make their service better and more valuable for users, or maybe, you know, expand their service to, to more country, to more markets, to whatever, right? Like they can do a lot of stuff. Or they can spend their time and resources to make sure the system works not when you have like 10x the usual load, but also 100x the usual load. And this is something that is not providing value to them. This is something that is not providing value to us. And I would even argue this is something that is providing negative value, right? Because if those people don't improve their service or build new service or extend their service to new market, what's going to happen is that we're not going to do 100x, right? 100x happen because people provide useful services and people start using it. And if we distract those people so that they need to do random stuff that has nothing to do with their business, then we're never going to do 100x. And so having a soft cap that is way, 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 way above what is the usual market demand, and starting to make is like almost 100 times what is the market demand for it, it's actually a denial of service attack that you open against anyone building on the chain. And we were talking before, like yesterday, we had a panel like, how do we attract developers? And one of the important stuff is that we need to value that over valuing something else. And when we take this kind of move, the signal that we send to the community, to the people working on that, is that people yelling very loudly on social media, their opinion is more valued than your work to make a useful service building on BCH. This is an extremely bad signal to send. So we don't want to send those kind of signals anymore. That's the first order effect, but there is a second order effect. And the second order effect is to scale when it's, you know, people who have experience in capacity planning. And as it turns out, big company like Google and Facebook and Amazon and stuff, they pay good money people. They pay like, you know, 700K a year people to do that work of capacity planning. And they wouldn't be doing that if they just had to listen to people yelling on social media to find the answer. Right? It's much cheaper to, to do the single option, except the single option is actually not very good because this is a very complex engineering problem and, and not everybody is like a very uh, you know, competent engineer in that domain specifically. And so you get to put yourself in the shoe of some engineer who have skills you know, in, in that particular area. They see that happening 
And what they see? Well, the first thing that they see is that if they join that space, they're going to have some level of competence, some level of skill, and it's going to be ignored by the leaders in the space. And, well, you know, ignoring their skills is not the, you know, the best way to value it, um, as it turns out. And so, and so because of that, you know, they are like, less likely to, to join it. But there is a <laughs> second thing that they are going to see, is that because they are ignored, some shit is going to happen. Right? Some stuff are going to break, some attacks are going to be made. And who is going to have, you know, who is going to be called to deal with that? What is them? Right? So not only they are not going to be valued for their stuff, but the fact that they are not valued for their stuff, it's going to put them in a situation where they are put into a bunch of fire that, you know, they would have known how to avoid in the first place. So that's an extremely bad value proposition for them to go work for us. And, and if we are going to be a world scale currency, then we need to attract this kind of people. And so we need to have a better value proposition and a better signaling than we send to them. All right. So that's the end of you know the first infrastructure stuff. Um, I want to talk about game theory a bit and specifically shelling points. So what is a shelling point? A shelling point is something that we can agree on without you know especially talking together. Um, there are a bunch of shelling points that exist already in the Bitcoin space. For instance, we all follow the longest chain that have certain rules, right? And we don't need to talk to each other. Like, I'm, if I'm, you know, getting my wallet, I have some amount of money, and I go to any one of you here, and you check your wallet, and you have the amount of money. Those two wallet agree, and we never talk to each other to come to any kind of agreement uh, about how much each of us have, you know, in terms of money. We just know why because we have a shelling point. We have a way to decide that without really communicating. So that's the longest chain. But also all the consensus rules that we have are shelling points. So for instance, we accept blocks up to a certain size, and we reject blocks that are bigger than that. And we don't constantly talk to each other like, hey, I'm fed. by the way, like do you do you accept like two megabyte block? Yeah, I do. But like, do you accept like three megabyte block? And, and tomorrow, will you do that? Right? We are not. We're not doing that as different actors in the space, like constantly querying each other. We just know there is block size that is a consensus rule that is agreed upon by almost everybody, and that's a consensus rule. And all the other consensus rules are effectively changing uh, chain point. And our role as a community is to create valuable chain points, right? You want to have a set of rules that provide as much value as possible for different actors in the ecosystem. Because this is how we win. And there is two parts to that. Even though like, it's just one sentence, it's, good, it's just one thing. But this is actually two things. The first one is that we need to decide what is a valuable chain point. And I think we're pretty good at this. And this is why we have a lot of utility. We have like, a very strong fundamental and all of that. We are very good at choosing what is a good chain point. We are very bad at actually creating it and making it strong. And so I'm going to talk about that. How do you create a new shelling point? Like, for instance, there was a block size and we wanted a new block size, right? So we need to create a new shelling point. How do you create a new shelling point that is very strong? You need a commitment strategy. That's, that's what it boils down to. And the typical example that is used when discussing shelling point is nuclear warfare. So, Think about that a bit. You have two countries that both have nuclear weapons. And one country sends a nuke on the other country. Destroys some city, whatever. It's bad. The other, like when you look at it from a purely rational perspective, you might assume that people are hungry and you know, very hungry and, and they want to retaliate, right? But if you put that aside, there is actually no benefit into retaliating. It's not going to rebuild the city, it's not going to make them money, it's not going to give them resources to rebuild it, it's not going to you know, make new friends, usually not. It's just going to destroy some stuff um, in the other guy that you know, would otherwise not change anything because the other guys already did the damage to us. So, if you want nuclear warfare to actually like, prevent war like we've seen mostly happening um, in you know, the past few decades, with the mutually ensured destruction theory, um, you need each of those countries to have a very credible commitment strategy, which is, if you nuke me, I will nuke you, and I'm committed to that decision, no matter what. I don't care if it's good or bad for me, if you nuke me, I will nuke you. 
And if you can commit to that strongly enough so that it's credible for other people, it's most likely that they are not going to nuke you in the first place because you know, they don't want to be nuked. And it's capital to understand that this commitment strategy is like it's actually the most important part of it. It's not the nuke, it's not any of it. It's the commitment strategy. You have the right commitment strategy, you can have all the nuke that you want, it's completely useless. Because you are not deterring anyone from attacking you. So I you know clarifies a bit, but there are many ex other examples like uh, uh, private property. It's something usually you're gonna be willing to put an inordinate amount of effort to defend. And effort that is usually way higher than the value of the property itself. Because this is your house, this is your car, this is your whatever. Um, and you know, you're pretty committed to it. And therefore you create a shining point over the fact that this is your house, this is your car, this is your whatever. People are willing to like, you know, use violence and whatever to, to defend their property. This is effectively like, even if you don't do it yourself, this is what happened when you call the cops, right? The cops are like, you are stopping violating that private property or we're gonna use violence against you. So people are, are willing to use like very disproportionate response, even in the you know, comparison of the value of the property. And this is what is creating the shelling point that allow private property to exist. This is the commitment strategy. And so the longest chain is another example. You have miner, and what miner do when they create a new block? Essentially they move from one shelling point when a bunch of people have some amount of money to a new shelling point where someone has moved. And we need to agree to the new shelling point. And what they do is that they commit a certain amount of resources to it via proof of work. And this is all they get us to pay attention to the new shelling point. And so USF is also a very good example of that, where people were like, we activate SegWit no matter what. Like, if it doesn't pan out, we just like bust in our chain and we're dead. Right? This is like the ultimate uh, commitment strategy. I mean, like, as far as like computer stuff uh, involved, <laughs> it's not like they're going to actually die or anything, but um, as far as like, you know, you can go in the computer space, this is very strong commitment strategy. So let me take an example that is fairly inconsequential in its consequences, but I think it you know, explained very well. The initial BCH ticker was BCC. I don't know if people remember that. Uh, personally, I remember reading about it. Uh, it was probably when we created it with uh, John Alv and a few other people. Um, and so, like, personally, I was for XBC, but I went with BCC, or most people wanted BCC, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, but it turned out that Bitfinex had some Ponzi scheme listed as BCC already. It was BitConnect, for those who remember. Carlos Matos, you know, great guy. Uh, but BitConnect was not exactly the best of ever. It was a Ponzi scheme. And so, as a result, Bitfinex decided to list Bitcoin Cash as BCH instead of BCC. And then, the ball started rolling, and now everybody uses BCH instead of using BCC. So it's not very bad. It's like, you know, the consequences are not, are not very bad. And I know that many of you are thinking that right now. And you're saying, like, why is this guy, like, bugging us about that? We don't care if it's BCC or BCH. And if you are doing that, you are exactly proving my point. Because um, there are people working for Bitcoin.com here, right? Bitcoin.com, yeah. So Bitcoin.com is launching an exchange, or just has launched, I don't know. Yeah, well, so, well, it's, it's either out right now or it's going to be out, you know, like very soon. Well, think about that. Make this, you know, thought experiment for yourself. Imagine that Bitcoin.com lists some Ponzi scheme as BDC, right? And then they decide to list Bitcoin as BTN. What do you think would be the reaction of the Bitcoin core supporter? Would they be like, ah, you know what, we don't want to be confused with uh, some Ponzi scheme, so we're going like, to change everything for BTN and go? No, they would like torch down Roger Ver even more than they're doing now. They would torch down Bitcoin.com. They would like insult anyone that even suggests that this was a good idea to go there. They would say that everyone that used the stuff that is called BDC, that is a Ponzi scheme, that it's a Ponzi scheme, and that is garbage, and that, you know, if you even talk about it, you are the human scum of the earth. Right? They would be like extremely committed to whatever they have. And I think this is a lesson that we need to learn from them. Because even though it's a ticker, it's not that important, but it's, um, it's that attitude that you need to be committed to those stuff if you want to create strong shelling points. 
that allow them to have very strong shading point and that does not allow us to have that strong of a shading point. Okay, so yesterday we have been talked by Justin Bosch from Cyber Capital. And one of the first things he said in his talk is that this company has a, little bit more, has a very strong position in BCH. And suddenly that changed the whole tone of the talk. You gotta take him seriously because his money is where his mouth is. You know that he's not coming on the stage and telling you random stuff that comes through his mind or trying to get you to do something that he's not gonna do himself, right? That doesn't mean he's right, maybe he's wrong. But if he's wrong, he's going bankrupt. And, you know, just for that reason, you know, it's it maybe like worth to listen to it like a bit more than some random people saying random stuff when they have no skin in the game. And, It makes him a, more of a leader in the space. I think there is like some, okay, we have some perception in that space that, you know, like we have a bunch of leaders, but many of them don't have skin in the game, and it's very important that they do. So when there is some perceived weakness from BCH, if you act as an investor, you're gonna diversify. If you act as a leader, you're gonna fix that weakness, right? And so, leaders, it's not like you can come here and be like, well, I'm a leader now. Leader are leader because people follow them. It seems like, you know, fairly obvious, but... <laughs> uh, and you are the people following the leaders, and I am as well. In that community, we decide to follow the opinion of some people more than the opinion of others. And those are the facto leaders of that community. And we need to make sure that those leaders that we have are like Justin Bonds. And, and, you know, make sure that they have a strong commitment to whatever they are leading you to. Right? Because otherwise you end up in that situation where <laughs> you got a leader, it's getting you to go somewhere, you know, he has some, he has some goal, he has some whatever, in that case, you know, he's not very happy with the British people. But he's like, give me freedom of Britain be death, you know, and I'm just gonna fight the British. But at the same time, he's like, you know what? Maybe this shit is gonna, gonna pan out. You gotta make sure you have like, you know, your backup plan together. Make sure you have your stash of British Pioneer. And, you know, many of us are gonna die, but that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's not the leader that you want. All right. So, I'm gonna go to two more examples and then, and then we're gonna be done with it. So one of them is Segway2x. Segwit 2 s came with a time where some people wanted to do USF. And USF was essentially people that set up a modified version of their Bitcoin node that would activate Segwit on August 1, no matter what. Right? No matter what miners do, no matter what like, other people do, it's going to activate Segwit. And either they are going to be on the network or they are going to be alone and bust. Well, the alternative proposal was Segwit 2 x where people would activate Segwit and then increase the size of the block. And what was happened is like one of those side of a very strong commitment strategy, and the other side, instead of choosing a proportional commitment strategy, what they did is that they modified the activation of Segwit2x to be compatible with USF. And in doing so, they both validate the commitment strategy done by the opposite side, and they weaken their own commitment strategy. So if you look at that, and you understand game theory a bit, you know what's gonna happen. You know what's gonna happen. Like USF, like the fight has not even started, USF already won. And when I saw that happening, it was a very important event to me because I saw that happening, I have some experience like in game theory and all of that, so I understood what was happening. And this is what led me to decide to commit to BCH, which was BCC at the time, 100%. Um, because I know Segwit 2 was tossed, even though it didn't even start it. Because even though they had like very strong cards, they were not playing their card right. And if you don't play your card right, it doesn't matter how strong your cards are. Okay, the second one is emergent consensus. And the reason I wanted to put those two examples here is because I think those are the two main examples that lead to the fact that BDC has small block and we have big block and we're a minority chain. Those are like the two biggest opportunities that we have to have big block on BTC and we blew them and both of them for the exact same reason. So emergent consensus is uh, um, like an interesting technology that allows you to trigger a bigger block without splitting the network. Essentially, if someone starts producing blocks that are bigger 
then um, you know network seems to be following the chain that has larger blocks, eventually they are going to fall back on that chain. And that's a very clever mechanism that allows you to um, make the consensus rule softer in a way. Right? When everybody has the same consensus rule, it still remains enforced. But if a majority of people want to move to a new point, they can do so while bringing others with them without creating a fork. So it's a very good activation mechanism for uh, changing the blocks, I find. So it can be used to, to activate other, other stuff. There is a problem, though. This mechanism is unable to set a new point. It's a way to activate a new shading point when you have one, but it provides like, no way to decide when and where or to what value or to anything that we're going. So this whole strategy lacks uh, the commitment aspect of it. And because it lacked the commitment aspect of it, uh, it was unable to activate properly. It was, it was good, but it was not sufficient in itself. It needs to be combined with a commitment strategy. And especially on that one, there are some researchers that wrote like a whole paper unpacking the whole game theory um, that essentially come to that conclusion that you know it's it's not gonna set a new size limit because it lacked the commitment aspect of it. But they go they go on it like they model all the mathematics of it and they give you like all the numbers and the probability and the different scenarios that are possible and how it pan out for various sectors. So this is a very interesting paper. If you want to see like because I'm kind of like explaining the game theory from a like you know, 100 mile perspective, but actually, um, you can deep dive into it, and uh, you know, if you want to know all the details, they, they are in there, people are doing that. This is an actual branch of mathematics. Okay, so, like, pretty much conclusion, we must avoid to weaken our commitment strategy. And that means that we need to work in a way where, first, there is decentralization happening. Everybody has ID, we fight over them, we find the one that are best, we decide where we want to go, we put that on the roadmap, and once it's on the roadmap, we need to commit to it. Because when people want to go like, oh, this is decentralized, and we do like random stuff after that, we achieve decentralization, not decentralization in you know, a cooperative manner, but in a, like, you know, atomization manner. You got like old atoms everywhere. We expose, we destroy ourselves. And we must require a leader to have skin in the game. So that we make sure that, that we have good leaders. So I, I can I have a tea, you know. <laughs> little, little schema to explain that, right? The process is really, we need to have negotiation between different parties. And because, because there is no boss, boss negotiation can last for a long time and be, you know, like tumult to boost and everything. And that's fine. That's what decentralization is looking like at that stage. And that's great. And that makes the system strong. But then once we made a decision, we got to commit to it to create a new shelling point. Because if we don't, the new shelling point is very weak, and we get you know, decentralization in the form of disintegration. And I think we have not been very good to you know, balance the two. Essentially, like, what I would like us to do going forward is encouraging as much as possible decentralization in like, the first form, but consider people who participate in the second form as hostile to BCH because their, their behavior is damaging to whatever we're doing. And they are often going to tell you, well, we can do that because it's permissionless and decentralized. And they're right, this is permissionless and this is decentralized, and they can do that. We don't have to take it seriously, we can show them the door. And, and not a single person can do that by themselves. But as a group, we can develop a culture where it's the norm to do that, and we have to do that. Okay, good question, maybe not, we don't have time, right? Okay, so no question.